करते हैं to another edition of Radio Hermetica on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I'm your host for the night, Andy Mercer, and my guest tonight is a friend of mine, John Canico James. John is an author and researcher based in London. His works have included children's books, articles on popular history topics, genre fiction, and historical research. John's particular research topic has been the historic belief in the supernatural and how people believe and what they believed and the criteria for those experiences. John, at the moment, is working at um, a fantastic location in London, which he can tell you more about himself in a few moments, and is also closely related to the book that he has recently completed, which will be published soon. But before we go into all that, uh, John just tell you a bit more about himself. John, over to you. The first thing I want to ask you, John, actually, is um, how do you pronounce your, your double-barreled surname? Never... Ah, it, right. Now, I'm going to be entirely honest with you. Mm-hmm. I might be about to mispronounce it too. <laughs> oh, bloody. <it. laughs> because it is my wife's uh, surname, and I sort of, I took it up when we got married, partly because... I sort of believe that, you know, it's not the 17th century anymore. My wife isn't my property, and therefore it, she shouldn't have to adopt my surname. Um, you know, partly because of a conversation with my father-in-law where he was wonderfully poignant and dramatic and sort of said, ah, oh, that name will now be dead. All of the children of my generation are daughters. And, and I subsequently then found out that my Japanese surname is basically the Smith of Japan. Um, <laughs> and that... I didn't know it well enough then, but my father was just a big drama queen. Um, <laughs> and so it's uh, Kaneko. Kaneko. And um, I most often pronounce it as Kaneko, which has a bit too much texture in it. Um, because I'm Welsh and I go up and down a lot. Mm-hmm. And well, the stress on, on uh, Kaneko it should be more or less flat, I believe. Right. Well, I must have, I've called you Kenko, James, before. I do apologise for that. Oh, God, loads of people do. Don't worry. The, the, <laughs> the various permutations of it that come up. Ah. Well, funny enough, actually, my wife's surname is the same as that, in that hers is, her own version is going to die out because there's no one of the same surname that's going to be left after sort of this generation passes away. But her surname's Cohen, so there's quite a few Cohen's around, so that's, <laughs> that's not going to die out completely. But certainly her version and her branch is disappearing too. And I don't know if I mentioned before, I'm old, so I'm half Welsh. My dad's Welsh, so... Although ah, I don't well, sound it. Obviously, you, you're from Wales. Whereabouts originally? Um, I am from Llanelli, ah. uh, home of the Scarlets, ah. and, uh, and a very, very good theatre. Excellent. And, so, uh, how did you yeah, end up in London? Oh, God. Um, it was a few things. Um, I sort of... I ended up dropping out of law school for a few different reasons, one of which being, by the way, there was a period where law jobs really bottomed out and that really sort of disheartened me um and it was around the time my father passed away it was a lot of things i dropped out and then i did a a bit of photography for a living for a while and then like just the economy in wales was contracting and contracting contracting so it got to the point where i decided to come to london and go back to university and do comparative religion at SOAS. Mm. And um, I, from there, I ended up running a bookshop. No. And um, it, that from there, I ended up at the Globe. Yes, we're getting on to that. Yeah. For those who are listening, well, my good friend John works at the Globe Theatre in London, which is the uh, a reproduction of the original Shakespeare Theatre. It's pretty much on the site of the original one, isn't it? We're about a two-minute walk away. Um, sadly, the original site, about a third of it, is under the main structural, southern structural sanction of Southwark Bridge. Oh, right, right. Uh, not deliberately, just mm. at the time <laughs> they didn't realise what they were doing. I think it was about 70 or 80 years before a historian just did a bit of a desktop survey. And uh, by sort of, you know, just looking at all the paperwork and 
looking through generations of old plans for things and then just realizing oh my god what have we done mm. and so we're as close as it's possible to be basically right i suppose it's one of those things it's a it's also a fairly modern thing the whole idea of trying to preserve history as as we do today until not that long ago they weren't that bothered were they really Oh, crumbs, no. I mean, and even when you get the very early kind of antiquarian slash archaeologists, um, a friend who is an archaeologist told me a story of like a really early one, 18th century guy um, using explosives, like gunpowder to blast open these uh, barrows because he just wanted to get at the trinkets oh, quicker. Good Lord. <laughs> it's quite terrifying when you think about the kind of damage that's been done that's just lost now and can't be rescued. It's, it is really quite frightening. Oh, God, totally. There are so many things that are obliterated. But it can happen with documents as well. Mm-hmm. A lot of the Elizabethan uh, spy networks were run by this chap called, I think I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, Thomas Phillips. And it's spelled Phillips, but I think it's Phillips. Yeah. And he kept astoundingly good notes. But unfortunately, they were destroyed in a flood of the Tower of London's basements in the 19th century. Oh, dear. And so we have, like, a tiny number of what was actually there. Um, And it's a shame because one of his diaries, well, one of his sort of commonplace books describes he was trying to crack various codes that were being used to communicate with Mary, Queen of Scots. Okay. And he he just got into a place where he thought, I need to understand the minds of her and the people around her. So she, he went to the estate uh, where uh, she was being held. And, of course, her people in France, uh, Thingamy of Guise, basically they were telling her, we've got people working. And the two diaries, Philip's diary and Mary's diary, synchronised because she sees Philip's walking the grounds of the house where she's being kept. And he's trying to get a little bit method about it and understand her to crack the code. But she thinks he's an agent working for her, and so she, like, smiles and waves at him. And he sort of smiles and waves back, and then you've got both sides of that interaction who wrote in their diaries, you know, him sort of going, I wonder what that was about. We've got to move a bit quickly. (laughs) And her going, oh, my God, maybe I'm going to be free. Blimey. (laughs) Slight misunderstanding, at least. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's interesting because, of course, um, preservation of records brings a little bit onto one of my main interests, as you know, Dr. John D., where some of Wait. his um, research was destroyed, unfortunately, either placed mm-hmm. underneath pyres, as in pies, cooked pies, or uh-huh. used to burn to start pyres in fires, basically, where the person who get, took possession of G- these um, chests not long after he died. They didn't know what they had, and this woman made apparently found a secret hatch in the chest and lots of people oh. were in it. And then she proceeded to use it to, say, either wrap in pies or just use to start fires. It's not cut entirely clear. Oh. It was, um, fortunately rescued not that long afterwards, um, burnt before they realised what on earth she was actually burning, and then Thankfully, they were rescued after that. But, um, yes, so you um, end up working at the Globe Theatre. How on earth did that come about? Right. Well, what happened was that the bookshop was always... It was one of these things. It was a small bookshop. Because of the way the rotor worked, I was pretty much always on my own. Um, We had, like, one person come in for half of the day, another person come in for the other half of the day. And so you're always on your own in a shop. And after a while, that got really wearing. Like, for example, I, I because there was no one else to do it, I ended up working multiple shifts with, like, illnesses that mm. probably I should have either stayed off sick or gone to hospital for. Um, like, I, I worked multiple shifts with full-on serious actual food poisoning. Oh, Lord. Um, one of the previous staff had passed out. And by the way, my employer didn't expect me to do it, but the fact is there was no one else to do it. Mm. And there were other sort of things as well, because it... All the tech there was very old. The building was sort of in a little bit of a state. It's been repaired now, and it looks lovely. But they, they had no effective heating. Oh, good. And so when the winter would come, it would be virtually the same temperature inside as outside. Oh. And after three winters of this, I just... I did get to the point where I was like, I have to do something else. Mm, yeah. And um, I, from there, I ended up at the Globe. Right. Um, so what is it you do there? Right, I am a tour guide. I also work in the exhibition, sort of facilitating and literally just making it happen and sort of scheduling tours and working upstairs, bringing people in. Uh, I've also just written a tour for them, which will be a 
product that's going to be sold really soon and i train people as well excellent so i guess you've met one or two famous faces who've um, performed it um right i've i met for like i think i've shared 14 words with stephen fry <laughs> right. which were mostly oh this way sir oh yes sorry this way no no this way <laughs> yep just that door there um or some variation of that mm-hmm. um I have been within 30 feet of David Tennant. Right. Um, the longest conversation I've ever had with somebody famous was Brian Blessed Bless. when he was emceeing an event in the exhibition, which is where I work. Right. Um, and that's probably the longest conversation I've had with a famous person, except for when Sylve- and I actually, weirdly, I tweeted this earlier, when Sylvester McCoy came up to me when I was standing outside one afternoon and asked if he and his family could have a tour. And I was immediately starstruck. Unfortunately, they couldn't because it was literally the middle of a show. Ah, uh, right. Um, but yes, the, the sad thing is, though, with it being a theatre, I, I get to see shows. But mm-hmm. I work in the heritage side of it, which takes place in literally a lightless basement full of cosmological and magical symbols right. which uh, means that and we have we have a world tree we have a giant artificial tree with a uh, sort of brass owl sitting in it um which holds the ceiling up because it's built around a structural pillar and um I, I don't get to see a lot, all the theatre stuff. I'll meet them too much because I, I dwell in the darkness and they dwell in the light. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I assume you're not going deaf from talking to Brian Blessed then. <laughs> oh, God, no. But he, he is an amazing chap. Yeah, absolutely. For our American listeners, he's um, very well known over here for having a very loud voice. He's also um, done quite a bit of Shakespeare as well, hasn't he? And Sylvester McCoy, if you don't recognise him, if you're an old fan of Doctor Who, he was one of the classic Doctors, as they get called these days, as opposed to the new reboot. So, yeah, it's been a couple of interesting people, certainly. But um, one of the most interesting things I wanted to talk to you about, of course, is the fact you have written a book, which is quite close to the whole thing to do with the globe theatre. It's, it's to do with Shakespeare, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, my big interest, you see, as a historian, is what people believed, how much they believed, and what were the conditions of their belief when it came to the supernatural. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense, because you sort of you see things like, for example, the fairies in Midsummer Night's Dream and uh, the demons. I mean, and you know, there are demon and exorcism references in multiple Shakespeare plays that uh, I don't think even one of them is actually directly supernatural. It just crops up as a thing in their lives. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've written my book, which is called, you know, This Isle full of Mo- is Full of Monsters, Shakespeare's Audience and the Supernatural, just exploring for a few different topics what the supernatural would have meant to the people standing in the Globe Theatre or maybe sitting indoors at his indoor theatre, the Blackfriars, watching Shakespeare's plays or other plays of the time. Mm. So what, what gave you the idea in the first place? Gosh, that's a really interesting question. Um, that's a good delaying tactic. You're not quite sure what to say next, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but no, it's because I'm trying to remember where this started, to be honest. <laughs> to be honest, I think where it started, if, if I try to think back, is I've always had an interest in the history of magic. Mm-hmm. and magical texts. I mean, I remember, I think, I can't have been older than about 21, 22, when the first of the Societas Magica, um, sort of magic and history volumes, came into the little water stones in Swansea. Right. And I bought those avidly and read them. And sort of, I mean, and I'd read sort of pagan books, and I'd read a lot of Golden Dawn sort of from a magical perspective books before mm-hmm. and sort of and th- those are my private religious beliefs that's another matter however this these books like the uh i think it's robert class it might be richard kikafer's forbidden rights which oh, is yeah. all the articles going into the munich book you know mm-hmm. um and that sort of got me i remember that was when i sort of was like oh my god i have to learn latin <laughs> and I was I, because I was so excited just by looking at the original text reproduced of the Munich book, and I think it started there. But from there, 
I was just, I found myself thinking because I also read a lot of the pamphlets and a lot of the books written by the elites mm-hmm. of their times, uh, sort of putting, you know, saying this is what it is. And of course, after a while, you start to find yourself thinking, is that how it is really? Mm-hmm. I wonder how many people could even read this book by this guy. Of those, how many people believed it? What did everybody else think? And so I. I started trying to answer those questions for myself. I got to do talks in various places. And when I was approached by the publisher, and I'm sorry to any Scots listening to this, right, so I'm going to try and pronounce it properly, but I am a Welshman. Uh, Be a Ah, right. A Scottish folklore and history publisher. Um, when I was approached by Be a I uh, sort of had probably about half of the book already written. Right. So it was, um, once you have that interest, you find it does give you great impetus to get working, doesn't it? Rather than just sort of writing in a vacuum almost. You, if someone's interested, you think, oh, that makes me more interested in getting it really moving forward. Um, so tell us a bit more about the book itself. I mean, we mentioned briefly kind of what it covers, but what, what, what in more detail can you tell us about it? Because I'm, I'm, just to let our listeners know, I did a little bit of um, proofreading on a couple of the more esoteric bits and pieces, and I find it absolutely fascinating re- reading through. And I found there's a lot of information packed into a f- relatively short book, although it's um, pretty good. It's just tell us more about the, the kind of detail of the book. Yes, of course. Um, basically, I sort of I didn't want it to end up being one of those books that somebody takes twenty years over. Um, I do think I will one day write that sort of book, but not this one. And to be honest, it even originally started off with the idea that I'd publish my collected talks and that I'd just have something to virtually give away to people whenever they came to a talk. But I couldn't leave it alone because (laughs) that's my nature. And so what I've done is I've chosen some of the main supernatural themes of early modern theatre, um, and I've gone into basically what they would have meant in cognitive terms to people. So what did people believe? What did they feel they were experiencing? And into the historical and social context of the time. So I start with magicians. I look at sort of who the real magicians were in their society. Mm-hmm. Who really was going about identifying them as, an, as a magician, practicing magic. Um, Then I do look at as well some fictional magicians and I do some, you know, some slightly obscure ones. Like I do the um, the Mary Devil of Edmonton, who is a sort of an English Faustus, you know, and uh, but he has a much happier ending, by the way, because that play is basically a romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of just the guy that helps the young lovers to get together and he's sort of actually quite a positive figure because as a magician he's able to kick over the status quo and sort of make sure the weak people who don't, weren't going to get justice get justice, which I quite like mm-hmm. um, but then I look at Prospero uh-huh. and sort of, you know is Prospero a an accurate magician of his time uh, what sort of magician is he, where does he sit in the progression of an early modern magician Mm-hmm. Because whereas sort of Marlowe's Faustus, who I also very slightly look at, but I didn't want to get too bogged down. But Marlowe's Faustus is a pre and during ritual magician. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we see his magical efforts and then we see him sort of make the pact and contract with Mephistopheles. And then we sort of see his use of his powers and his adventures. And Prospero kind of fits into that framework. But whereas the sort of the late acts, I think it's act three in Faustus where the adventures begin and you get this weird, crazy set of like episodes where Faustus is traveling in time and shit and things. Um, And Prospero's in that phase. That's where we meet Prospero because he's already got the spirit Ariel. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really need ritual magic tools to do things. I mean, he has his staff that is, to my knowledge, only really name-checked at the end. When he decides to 
like sort of break his staff and drown his books and things. I think that's the only time he really mentions it. So he doesn't need the staff for power. Mm-hmm. He has Ariel, the spirit yeah. that does the magic for him. And and then I look at, of course, well, although most people doing magic, like the vast majority were either clerics or self-educated middle-class people, how realistic would it have been for a duke to try and be a magician, really? Mm-hmm. And so we just look through some magical texts of the era. I look at the strictures they put on you as a magician, and then I compare it to Prospero's description of why he was kicked out as Duke of Milan. And, yeah, to be honest, it's like it more or less tallies up that if you were doing all the stuff in the magic books, you wouldn't be a functional ruler. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, it requires so much from you. Yes. You know, um, all of the, the abstinence from various things and things you wouldn't even think you had to abstain from. Um, the clothing requirements, would that really be suitable to be the Duke of somewhere? Mm-hmm. Uh, all of that stuff. And the isolation requirements. Mm-hmm. Lots and lots of the spells had very tough requirements for isolation yeah. and some of them were very antisocial forms of isolation like leaving all urban settlements and things yeah and so yeah so i, I look at that and talk, say that basically to be honest your prospero was a dude trying to be a magician he probably deserved to be kicked out of milan <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's certainly true of medieval magic it often requires a lot of effort a lot of um, planning a lot of time as you quite say on your own consecrated areas away from other people you know disappearing off for days at a time and then also probably ruler of a particular area you would have a hard time marrying those two up unless of course you can be fast and take shortcuts and just ask for direct help from mephistopheles of course that's the, the legend what do you think about the idea that um shakespeare based um, and prosper on John D. Now, here is the thing about John D. Now, you actually, this is an interesting conversation for the two of us to have because mm. I'm going to ask you something. Sure. How famous in his own time was John D? It's an interesting, because it is a good question. One of the things that is quite obvious with uh, historians up until very recently is they almost tried to write him out of the history of the Elizabethan times, trying to make him pretty much invisible because of perceived embarrassment mm-hmm. about the so-called Richard Enochian magic that he was known for. But he was certainly a close friend of the Queen Elizabeth I. He'd often go to his house and visit in Mortlake and have private sessions of discussion. So anybody who was in court would have known who John Dee was. It was an absurd no secret of his direct connections with the Queen, even down to the point where she went to him to find the correct date for her coronation, to be a long sister of coronation, which of course it was. So, yes, he was pretty famous in royal circles okay. sort of hierarchy at that time, definitely. But, as I say, the problem is in many books up until very recently written about Elizabeth I and that period almost write him out of history completely. And it's only recent of authors and writers of history of, many, of that particular time frame who put him back into where he should be. But yeah, no, he was Certainly very well known at the time. Well, this is the thing. I mean, because my thing with you, the reason I ask you that is because we must always be wary to separate context of the time from the, from what we now have. Mm-hmm. And one of the things about D is that because his records have his stuff has survived comparatively well. Like we, you know, for example, there's one chap called I think he's referenced called Gresham who seems to have been quite famous, but we have no, we have nothing survived him but his name. Right. Um, and but with Dean, there's, we've got a lot of stuff. We've lost stuff too, I know. Yes. But we've got a lot of stuff about D, And so we know a lot of stuff about D as people of the 21st and 20th century. Mm-hmm. And so my thing is, just because we know all this about D, I don't know if, Londoners and Shakespeare knew that about D. Mm. Um, because, for example, the magician mentioned much more often in the early modern theatre world is Simon Foreman. Yes, yes. However, I don't feel uh, that Prospero is based upon Simon Foreman. Right. Because Foreman's just wrong. He doesn't, he doesn't strike the chords for Prospero. Um, for D, maybe... Maybe there's some reference in there to D having to, 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 to D's flight from England. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, it's possible that it was a tug in the back of Shakespeare's mind. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what I would also say, though, is that 
Prospero is very much the sort of wizard figure that you see in a lot of the romances and the earlier romances mm-hmm. as well. And so if, it, if there's a sort of an inspiration for him, I reckon it's the sort of wizard you see in the earlier romances. Right, right. I reckon if you, in fact, I reckon if you want a D inspired figure in um, early modern kind of play going, Faustus is basically a sort of John D. Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa hybrid. Mm-hmm. Like some parts of Faustus' life and achievements are, D, are very D resonant. Right. And others are very, very Agrippa resonant. Sure, sure. Well, certainly things like Prospero's books, we know very much that D had one of the most extensive libraries of any kind, pretty much in the Western world. But certainly he had a, a huge collection of occult material and manuscripts, which he was, you know, quite closely guarded. Which is always the odd thing when he leaves off to go off to Europe. He just leaves his house sort of locked up, and it's all this material is in the house, and it gets broken into a lot, gets stolen while he's in Europe. Yes. So, but again, as you say, that idea of him sort of taking flight and leaving off if going off into Europe, which of course is what Dee does at the invitation of um, and there's a Polish uh, Majleski, not Majleski, he's a 1920 <laughs> gangster <laughs> yeah the chap's name, but yeah, a Polish um, remember Polish sort of oh, invites him across into Europe he's in my book, I can't remember his name either <laughs> no, it's not Majleski, that's for certain <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but yeah, I mean that can parallel the idea of old um, Prosper just sort of disappearing off as well. But I mean, that comes to the other question, of course, is how well known and how famous was Shakespeare in his time? He seems to know an awful lot about high court and how it all operated. And there is always that question of how did he know all this stuff about um, things like the Danish court, for example, with Hamlet and sort of our own high high um, circles. Uh, well, it's an interesting question, I always thought. This is one of the big misconceptions, though, because here's the thing. Um, I mean, number one, all of these courts of Europe were the Kardashians of their era. Mm-hmm. They were incredibly famous on a popular level. They had all the cool clothes. They had all the daring exploits. And so they're pop. it's not like knowing a lot about government now or popular culture or, so, well, or royal culture now. Mm-hmm. They were much more famous. But the other thing with Shakespeare is a lot of this stuff he just kind of adapts. I mean, Hamlet, he didn't invent the story of Hamlet. It, ex- it existed in Europe as a story for a long while before Shakespeare was around. Mm-hmm. Um, Ham- Shakespeare's Hamlet is an adaptation, um, and so are a lot of his stories. They come from continental, like Romeo and Juliet. Um, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet was the third English language Romeo and Juliet, oh, and it was about the fifth or sixth Romeo and Juliet to exist in, ev- anywhere, with editions existing in French and Italian as well as English. Right. Um, and you can even tell, by the way, which Romeo and Juliet Shakespeare read. Okay. <laughs> because there's a specific English language one that brings in the nurse, and right. no other versions have the nurse. Ah, I see. And that's what Shakespeare was. He was a prolific reader. One of my colleagues and friends at the Globe, uh, she did her master's on mentions of disease and infection in Shakespeare. And obliquely through that master's, you can show how voracious a reader Shakespeare was because so many phrases from these books about disease and plagues, and some of them lurid, some of them quite technical, by the way, uh, would end up in sort of Shakespeare place. And for the dates, you can see it was that way around. And I mean, to be honest, some of the plays he wrote, if you look at the diaries of the owner of the Rose Theatre opposite the globe, uh, plays like the Scottish play, plays like... Um, Oh, gosh, uh, not the Jew of Malta, the Shakespeare one, uh, the Merchant of Venice, and all of that. They were, versions of those were on at the Rose years before Shakespeare wrote them. Right, okay. And he he obviously was either tapping into a pop culture thing, Mm -hmm. or he was um, sort of basically nicking it and writing it for someone else. Mm -hmm. Uh, He he was more than this, this... seeded person in the heart of the establishment, although he did get very popular. He was a voracious reader. 
and a judicious, I'm going to be polite to the Shakespeare sphere, adapter. <laughs> Fair enough. What is it you would you say then that makes him so much more popular than other writers of that time? Why is he the one that's endured more than others? What is it do you think is particular to his way of writing, his storytelling, if you like, that made him so much more successful historically? The simplest thing of all I would say is that his work is his plays are most of mostly just better plays. Um I mean I I mean to this area even for my book i went through a lot of obscurities and to be honest with you shakespeare's plays are well written drama the stories are good the characters make sense the things that happen they are in a language that is now a little difficult for us but they carry you through Mm -hmm. at the time they were written in the vernacular as well and one of the things is although he for example he might only have been adapting romeo and juliet he was probably of the two of the three right British writers that did it, including him. He was the best writer because really? I've read them, and he, his version is the best written version. <laughs> um, and that was the thing, basically. Even though maybe it's possible to say a lot of his stuff wasn't very original, um, it doesn't matter because he was such, he was a good writer. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the re- one of the reasons his language is a little harder for us to understand is because he was writing in the vernacular of the street whereas more sort of artsy academic writers like John Lilly, their stuff is easier for you to understand because it's a more rarefied form of English mm-hmm. but to be honest it's just they're just not as good plays <laughs> fair enough like, oh sorry carry on no no you can well like the, uh, the Witch of Edmonton I've used The Witch of Edmonton relatively kind of um, heavily in my book Mm -hmm. because it's got some wonderful quotes in it about um, how witches work in society. And so there's a wonderful, in fact, I've got it in front of me. Um, So uh, this is from Act 4, Scene 1. The Witch of Edmonton, right? Yeah. First line. He is none now, Mother Sawyer, but this gentleman, myself, and you. Let us have some mild questions and you mild answers. Tell us honestly and with free confession, we'll do our best to wean you from it. Are you a witch or no, (laughs) Mother Sawyer? I am none. The Justice, Justice. be not so furious, furious, Mother Mother Sawyer. Sawyer. I am none. None but base curs so bark at me. I'm none or would I were. If every poor woman be trod on thus by slaves, reviled, kicked, beaten, as I am daily, she to be revenge had need to turn witch. Mm. And that's a wonderful line about what witches are. Mm. Um, however, as a play, it's, it's not a great play. <laughs> You make it sound so good that you're reading. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely, yes, yeah. Oh, thank you, Raj, but uh, oh, it's dull. <laughs> Fair enough, so was the trouble of reading it then. <laughs> um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about as well, uh, there's quite a long section, or a couple of sections, dealing with the idea of demons. Now, it's interesting because we previously met at a um, conference in Buscastle last year where you um, were one of the speakers are talking more around about curses, but I know there was some briefly talked about demons then as well. It's um, interesting. What, what, First of all, what would you say was Shakespeare's own view of, th- or Shakespeare's view of magic to begin with? What would you say was his a view of such things? Ah, now, there were a couple of figures within early modern theatre who you can tell were genuinely interested. One of them is a chap I mentioned for a second earlier, John Lilly. Um, John Lilly was obviously interested in the esoteric and the theological. I'm not going to say he was a practitioner, we can't know that. But, you know, he was interested in it. Mm-hmm. Um, ben Johnson... Mm-hmm owned a couple of magical books, although he was a sceptic. Um, I do wonder if he was a sceptic after having tried things and had gotten no luck out of them, if you know what I mean. Yes, yes. Um, and again, and he, Johnson, the alchemist, um, the devil is an ass, he is fascinated with devils and demons, even though 
with the alchemist, he takes the piss out of every possible form <laughs> of like supernatural practitioner he can write. Um, still, you can see he's interested. Mm. However, with Shakespeare, I've got to be honest, thinking through his portrayals of the supernatural, Shakespeare was interested in magic sort of in a very sort of Avengers Assemble sort of way. <laughs> you know, in about the same level as the writers of the Thor comics and things right, right. are interested in um, Norse mythology, basically. Yeah. Because most often magic in a Shakespeare play is basically a big red button mm. with the words advanced plot by pressing this written uh-huh. on it. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say a plot device, very much. Yes, literally a, a transparent plot device. However... Mad, that's, that's his view seemingly on magic. Now, he has some really interesting views on demonic possession. Uh-huh. Now, I, I would personally say that he was a sceptic. Um, and in fact, this is me doing... So, now this is probably me sticking my neck out the furthest you'll ever see me. <laughs> but I think from... The things that are written in Twelfth Night... Sorry, yes, in the play Twelfth Night. Because the character Malvolio in Twelfth Night, Mm -hmm. uh, he sort of... They they sort of do a bit of making everyone think he's mad and that he's gone insane and he gets locked up and they lampoon that he's possessed. But some of the things said in that scene are reminiscent of things that a writer and um, cleric called Samuel Harsnett, who was the Bishop of London's confessor, that he wouldn't write in a book for two years. Right. And then when that book did come out two years later, Shakespeare's King Lear comes out after it, and it's full of references to that book. And so Samuel Harsnett was basically the sort of Puritan smasher general in some ways. (laughs) Uh, He was releasing all of these books against John Darrell, the big... Lancashire Puritan exorcist and so or was it just general north of England yeah, either way uh, John Darrell the big sort of north of England Puritan exorcist and I think even I think Shakespeare had either read his books but even possibly was friends with him or at least had some sort of relationship with him to be using material that would come up in Darrell's book later um, yeah. Of course, it's possible that Daryl simply went to see Twelfth Night and was like, yeah, that's really good. <laughs> kind of reverse the whole thing, yeah. Um, but either way, Shakespeare had opinions about demonic possession, and he basically thought that it was rubbish. Fair enough. Um, carry on. That's it, fair enough. That's... Um more modern thinking I think you're probably quite right as well and I've discussed on many occasions with many people about demonic position and shouldn't obviously um, mental illness and the two have been mixed up mixed together quite a lot over the years to try and explain abnormal behaviour without us understanding the human psychology now we have a better understanding idea of how human psychology works you'd think the idea of demonic position may have gone out the window completely but it still continues to be a belief system which is a shame yeah. but it's what works for people some people find the idea of they're demonically possessed and if they have an exorcism they feel better if they feel better Great, that's all that really matters at the end of the day. Well, that's the thing. And it's whether possessing the demon by the first place is another matter entirely. But there is a. I wanted, wanted to talk to you a little bit more about also yeah. a particular section about this transforming ghosts into demons, um, sort of Calvin and Luther. Ah, that's, yeah. That's quite interesting. Oh, perhaps you tell us a bit about that section particularly, because I think that's quite fascinating. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, this is the thing. Oh, actually, by the way, later on, I'd like to go back to demonic possession. Oh, and um, psychology as well. But Ooh. Calvin and Luther and ghosts. And <clears throat> there's a little bit of a Venn diagram when it comes to the dead in the sort of after the Reformation. And sort of Calvin and Luther, you know, very much against all of the superstition of the Catholic Church, most cynically to break the power of the chantries and to break the sentimental hold the Catholic Church had over people. Mm-hmm. Because, of course, one of the big things about the Catholic Church is that you can intercede for your dead relatives who are in purgatory. You can have prayers said for them to make their bonds easier. You say masses for them. There are lots of remembering the dead sort of ceremonies that still go on in Spain, for example. Mm-hmm. And so 
if you can sort of break that hold of that sentimental hold the Catholic Church has on people's dead relatives, it's easier to steer them away from the church. Also, the money given to the chantries, uh, especially by the very, very um, sort of rich and the nobles and things, that was a serious income for the church. So there's there's that very cynical aspect of Calvin and Luther not believing really in ghosts. But there it was also a solid theological lineage to what they were saying. Right. That essentially ghosts could, well, the spirits of human beings could not return from the afterlife. Uh-huh. Once they're up there, they're gone. They can't appear to you. If you have a dream with, for example, your dead parent in, that's a dream. Right. Or you're mad and you're sort of hallucinating from melancholy. Or you are looking at a demon in human form mm-hmm. who has come to meddle and to do sort of things they shouldn't. And that was another thing that was put on necromancers and magicians. That basically, even if a necromancer or magician said he could get you contact with your dead relative, with a dead friend or whatever, he can't really. He's just getting his demon to assume human form. Right, yeah, yeah. And yeah, and that came out of Calvin and Luther. It was a popular elite belief in England. But, I mean, there's there's a relatively decent amount of evidence that at a grassroots level people still more or less sort of believed in ghosts mm-hmm. um, but that, that's how that is sadly, well not sadly but that's how that is uh, there's always a disconnect between the very top of the elite and sort of the grassroots people on the ground even now You know, I think you know Professor Chris French would have a very different view about ghosts uh, to people attending a uh, paranormal night at Coney Hatch or sort of um, that nuclear bunker and oh, yes. uh, Kelvin um, Hatch rather. Times, Kelvin Hatch, I've been there a few times myself actually. I um, have a little um, confession. I was on one of, the, one of the very first investigations ever at that place. It happened to be that the relative of one of our group was um, the owner. Of the site. Oh, very cool. It was kind of a conversation suggesting to him that he could open up to the public in, at night as well as during the daytime because he was pretty much gifted the bloody place by the, the Ministry of Defence when they closed wow. it down. So we were one of the very earliest. And it is an odd location. There's some strange stuff there, but that's on the side. I think also comparing Chris French to when he first started out would be a very different Chris French because I think he was a bit of a believer to begin with and his scepticism grew more and more as he investigated, as far as I can remember. I might be mistaken with somebody else. No, he, you're correct because he said as much at the last ASAP con in his paper. So, yeah, no, no. And and that's another thing about sort of people in general. Their views change over their lives. Mm. Uh, Like, for example, with Ben Johnson, I I would put money on the fact that Johnson didn't have a magical book as a curious skeptic originally. I reckon he probably had a go Mm. at some point in his life. And it was that experience of going through it that possibly made him a skeptic. Yeah. Um. But, I mean, that, that hinterland, they're talking about ghosts again, between the ghost and the demon mm-hmm. and mental illness, uh, that is part of a debate that has been going on since before, you suspect. Because, you know what you're saying about people in the modern era, yeah. uh, you'd think that with greater knowledge of psychology uh, that we would have vanquished the idea of demonic possession. Do you know in 1566... There was, a, no, sorry, it was 1599, the 1666, 1566 case was the successful one. But by 1599, there was a French surgeon called Marisco arguing exactly what you're saying, mm-hmm. that this particular person who thought they were possessed, and in fact, probably all people who thought they were possessed, uh, were basically just suffering mental illnesses. There was an English doctor, I think it was Dr. Jordan, who said the same thing who wrote a big book called On the Suffering of the Mother, more or less, which yeah. was about, again, mental illness, causing demonic possession. Um, in fact, even within the church, there was one late 16th century French demoniac. And a bishop basically, no, so an archbishop exercised her, but he did it in the form of an, exper- an actual double-blind experiment. So what he did is... He did his blessing over one bowl of water and 
he then exorcised her with a non-consecrated bowl of water. And he read out some Latin from the Bible without telling her it was from the Bible and sort of letting her believe it was something else. And then he exorcised her with, like, the opening chapter of Virgil. Right. And he successfully produced uh, exorcism phenomena in her with the chapter of Virgil and the normal water, and he persuaded... And basically, he got her to drink an entire glass of holy water with, uh, without flinching or suffering. And that was late 16th century France. And so there's always been that dialogue yes. um, in the sort of in possession. Or at least, I wouldn't say always, but for a very long time, there certainly has been. Of course, there's also um, Johann Weir's book, De Prestatius Demonominum, which I can almost get right sometimes, which um, even Freud recommended as a bit more recognised as being one of the top ten most important books ever written, where he was, where was essentially saying that it is all just imagination and it could well be a mental illness that's causing all this um, witchcraft particularly, but also that involves possession as well. So that's another important text. So the as you quite rightly said, the idea that it's not really demonic possession isn't just a modern thing. It's been around for a while, but unfortunately it's... it's well, it, because it goes against the church, we know how powerful the church used to be, it tends to be um, kind of pushed to one side and often seen almost as proof of demonic possession because you're claiming they're not possession by demons, so therefore you must be possessed, which is rather ridiculous. But I've certainly read that kind of thing yeah. as well, definitely. It, so, it's the trouble when, when a sort of an idea like that turns in on itself to protect itself, mm-hmm. unfortunately. And again, that exact narrative that you just said, again, that was one of the narratives being bandied about by the Puritan exorcists um, against people like Harznet, who was writing books saying that it's all rubbish and the ones who aren't fakers are mentally ill. Um, And, you know, the main defence was, yes, but, you know, that's the Church of Satan. That's the devil infiltrated, sort of vainglorious Church of England, which is sort of a mixture of a bit too Catholic and a bit too sort of devilish. Mm-hmm. It's quite amazing really, what little twists and turns you uncover when people try to argue and counter-argue particular points and you think, mm, OK, well, that's, that's easy to say, but what more can you say about something like that? It's the, it's the game playing, isn't it, if you like? The, the, we are the correct ones, we have the right to real information, we are the ones to believe in, you're wrong, and if you're wrong, you're therefore you are the devil in disguise. <laughs> oh, Lord, yes. <laughs> um, and it's one of those things with any idea... If there's no point where you ever hear somebody say, I don't know, then I think in any idea of any kind, you should be very suspicious. Hmm. And if you ever push somebody to the point where what they should say is, I don't know, and instead they tell you that you've done something wrong, Hmm. I think with religion, with anything, that is another point to be very suspicious of what you're being told. Yeah. Um, And, yeah, you see it in all aspects. You certainly see it in this sphere that we research. Indeed. <laughs> it's obviously often about the power and control of individuals over individuals. You know, you're doing this, not doing it right. I am. Therefore, you should be following me and I know what I'm doing. And, oh, by the way, pay for me. You know, pay me to teach <laughs> this stuff. It's like, okay, you know. I mean, there are oh, yes. teachers who teach esoteric material out there without a doubt. There's also quite a few that you think, hmm, do you actually even know what you're talking about? Must <laughs> let's teach somebody else that stuff. It's, it's quite alarming. But it's one of those fields, as we can say, talking what we were saying before about John Dee being exercised out of history because of his occult, you know, the occult still even now is seen by most people outside of it. It's just a bunch of loonies at best and demonically possessed at worst. So why would oh, you yes. expect a rigour of um, investigation and you know, a high level of critique work being done? You're talking about nonsense and rubbish, so why would it be, you know, why would there be any kind of academic work involved? But of course that's not the case. It is something that's becoming more and more recognised that there's something to this stuff, whether you believe in the true supernatural or believe it's or psychological is, a, is a, another question of course but it's not something you can just simply ignore it doesn't exist because there's too much out there oh gosh totally um in fact interestingly on on that topic of the sort of aspects of people being excised from history and dismissed um one of my little hobby horses just in the sense that i'd love to have a grant to sit down and just do this for a year but you know that's probably never going to happen um <laughs> is female grimoire magicians. Mm, Yes, that would be interesting. Now, sadly, because they are very marginalised figures, I mean, they are not even a full subset of women. 
you know, they're they're sort of a subset of a subset of a subset because they are literate women who there are not that many. Uh, in London, I think it's about just under one in ten women would have been literate. Yeah. Um, and London was very literate. That was like the most literate place in Britain in 1600, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and of those one in 10, how many would have been involved in Britain by Magic? Well, probably not even as many as one in 10. Mm. But you can still see signs that these women existed. Yeah, yeah. And I sort of found one, I believe, well, someone I believe to be one in Roy in 1607, a woman called Anna Taylor. And I wrote a little bit on my blog about her. Yeah. Um, because if you go through with books like VB26, the uh, for sale as the Book of Oberon, yes, which is a magical book with a lot of fairy magic in it, and if you look at some of the fairy magic manuscripts collected by the great, um, oh gosh, Catherine Briggs, yes, you can see that this woman Anna Taylor was doing fairy magic. She was doing grimoire magic. Mm -hmm. And then there are other things in her trial. I think it's worth pointing out that when we talk of fairy magic, we're not talking about the sort of modern, new age, airy fairy, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about something quite different. I think perhaps we can briefly just talk about the different notions of fairies of, of sort of medieval times compared to what we talk about today. Because, you know, it's one of those things that comes up in the sort of new age circles of fairy magic and unicorns and that kind of thing. And this is somewhat different to that, isn't it? Oh, Lord, yes. I mean, you know, if, if there's anyone listening out there who has, like, the modern conception of fairy magic, I fully respect your path. Everybody's entitled to their path, and I fully respect yours. However, historic fairies and the fairies that Anna Taylor would have lived with in Rye were a very different thing. Um, they were the product of so many different aspects of culture mashing up against each other, um, you know, you've got aspects in England of the kind of the Norse mythology and the Danish mythology, bringing these sort of creatures down from northern Europe. Uh, and those are sort of those fairies. They're quite martial and they're quite dangerous and they're quite dark. But then you have a little bit of a crossover with fairies and the undead. So fairies are ghosts and some ghosts if you don't have them properly sort of ceremonially laid to rest, can become fairies. And if you don't have your dead relatives properly laid to rest, they can end up being kidnapped by fairies after death and become fairies. Um, and then fairies are also demons. And in some of the medieval romances and medieval um, uh, theological books, fairies pay a tithe to hell every so often because uh, they're a client civilization of hell. But then equally in other books, fairies are um, sort of religious. And so in Gerald of Wales's book, you find fairies who are these sort of Christian, God-fearing types that just live in another land. And so fairies are not the cute, cool fairies at the bottom of the garden. <laughs> they are like us. They live in a world that is barely separated from ours. They, however, they can be quite ret retributive. Uh, you know, they regularly blind people. They can give you an illness that is not unlike having a stroke. Um, they kidnap our children. They sort of, they have not always fully consensual sexual relationships with sort of young women found alone in sort of lonely places. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, they are these very sort of dodgy, liminal, sort of quite dangerous creatures. Mm -hmm. But they have huge potential. And so all of this magic, it is very much the that Anna Taylor does. It is fairy magic, but it is very much the sorts of ritual magic you would see done with demons. Mm -hmm. And as, as you might know, Andy, in, in VB26... You know, the spell to summon Oberon, it is not a sort of spell where you put all your crystals out <laughs> and, and, and stuff. It, it is a proper, fairly sort of Solomon tradition invocation where you've got your circle and your tools 
and you're binding him with god names and being super careful um and it's more that sort of fairy magic that anna taylor was doing with a couple of the more folk elements that you see in vv26 so yeah there's one point at which she's got these white sticks she's ramming into the ground and in vv26 there is a spell like that and it exists in another manuscript as well found by Catherine briggs uh, and that's to find treasure yes and there are fairy names on the sticks. Um, in fact, the whole of the trial is because her, this woman, Taylor, her neighbour is basically her Edward Kelly. Right. Because her neighbour starts having visions and dreams. And Anna Taylor's trying to push her towards asking the fairies where they'll find buried treasure. Mm-hmm. And sort of they wish they have an altar to the fairies in their house. And she gives offerings to them and that sort of thing. Right. It's interesting, of course, that we talk about buried treasure. Most people tend to think of sort of pirates and that sort of thing. But it was not uncommon in those times for relatively wealthy people to actually literally bury their wealth underground because obviously there are no banks, etc., that we have today to keep it hidden and then would pass away and then money would be forgotten about or the, the, the um, jewels of gold or silver or whatever would have been forgotten about. So it was a common practice to try and find real buried treasure and often use magical means. It's one of the things that Edward Kelly had as kind of a side venture and often used to go disappearing off trying to find buried treasure that he believed he'd found or had contact with and as far as I know they never found anything but it was a common thing for old Edward Kelly to go and gallivanting off trying to find buried treasure while I supposed to be working with D. So Oh god yes totally. Um and yeah the idea of there being buried treasure was a huge part of their popular culture but also yes there really was buried treasure in places. Indeed. Um there really were lost caches of buried treasure. Um, I mean, even in the Great Fire of London, Samuel Pepys buried a couple of things because he couldn't take it with him when he was fleeing London, so he buried it. Yeah, I think they buried cheese and things like that, which you think, what the hell would you want buried cheese for? But it does actually preserve it quite well if it's well wrapped up. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. And it was quite a large amount, I think, of Parmesan as well. (laughs) So that would have been quite expensive at the time. You know, another fairy magician, um, right, he's one of the two Williams that I studied. And it's annoying for me with my useless brain because they're both William W. Oh. And one of them's William Witchley and the other one's William something else. And basically this chap, he again was a, a treasure finder using magic. And he was basically a sort of 16th century occult detectorist, mm. you know, because what he did was learn ritual magic, get all the gear and then just go around the countryside getting paid by people to um, to do spells to summon spirits like Oberon and to summon the spirits of the dead to try and detect local buried treasure. Mm. So, yes, no, it was a huge thing. And, yes, and Kelly is exactly the right sort of person to be doing it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this sort of self-educated, slightly outside of society type. Mm-hmm. Sort of Arthur Daly, if you like. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, the TV show. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's a bit outside. Well, we're actually running out of time, believe it or not. This is ah. so you've flown by. Um, so, where can people discover more about you, John, if you don't mind? If a website or you mentioned your blog, you by all means let us know what the blog address is. Oh, yes. Well, if you are interested in sort of in my research, if you're interested in learning more about the books I've got coming out, then the two places you're best probably going to get. Uh, a chance to follow me is if you follow my blog, which is johncanicojames.com, or if you find me on Twitter, which is john underscore kj writer. And if you follow me there, you then I po- I post up uh, new blog posts semi regularly, fairly regularly, and um, I've got not only this history book coming out uh, in early June. But also later in the year, I've got a fiction series coming out as well. So, yes, follow me for those. And the book is going to be called This Island is Full of Monsters, or do you think you might be changing the title? At the moment, it is still This Island is Full of Monsters. Right. And so, yes, keep a lookout for that. Well, I hope you've um, enjoyed uh, our conversation this evening. It's been absolutely fascinating. We've um, covered quite a few topics. In fact, there's a couple of topics you wanted to talk about we didn't even get to. So perhaps <laughs> I'll have to have you back on again another time. If that's all oh, right. I'd love to. Thank you.
Well, this has been me, as always, with Radio Hermetica, and I'm just going to say goodnight for everybody, and I will have another show for you next month, as usual, I have no clue what it's going to be about, that'll be something I'll work out during the intervening time for that. But thank you very much for listening to Radio Hermetica, and I hope you have a good evening. Goodbye. Thanks very much.